to do side burn lecture, but I had very few slides because I wasn't um, in any means for that purpose. We will do about five slides uh, during the lecture, and I shall show you five minutes worth of tips at the end of the lecture because there, some, there might be some of you who don't want to watch it. So you can wait outside and come back in. It is quite grueling, so you really need to ask yourself whether you're up to it or not. So you get some indication from the slides. Now, before I want to uh, start to read my paper, I'd like to thank Mark, Mark Cousins, uh, who is known to all of you, because I am deeply indebted to him for many things, but in particular, and these read this paper, for some of the ideas he developed uh, in his current course on ugliness in his Friday lectures, and in particular, uh, his grasp of the inside-outside opposition on which I heavily rely. Okay, I'm going to read this, uh, some of it. Some of it I'll, I'll, I'll say when in the next 10 minutes will be difficult. There's a difficult 10 minutes in the middle. Um, I'm happy to take questions at the end of it if you feel really um, at sea. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can take questions in the discussion. Okay, the paper is called Operation Orlan. Orlan is the French artist who actually undergoes cosmetic surgery and had seven operations uh, as part of a lot. In his seminars on ethics and on the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, Lacan considers the issue of anamorphosis and its relation to art. The emergence into focus of a distorted image is important because it demonstrates that there are two moments of viewing, not one as it might seem in everyday life. It shows up a gap between those two moments. In Holbein's The Ambassadors, which you have seen in the National Gallery, we see a blur or a skull, depending on our point of view. I assume you're all familiar with the picture. When we see a blur, we want to see the painting as a treasure house of worldly objects. But once we have seen the skull, a gap opens up between it and the blur, which makes the picture incomplete. An object is missing insofar as the other is now incomplete. This is not a moment simply of deprivation. It is the moment which reveals the structure of the illusion of the image and the subject's wishes in respect to it. I should argue that the work of the artist Orlan and her pictures, they're hard to call pictures, but it's difficult to find a more accurate word, that her pictures have to do with anamorphosis. I should also argue that this anamorphosis bears upon sexual difference. The anamorphosis I have in mind is not of the pictorial and perspectival kind to be found in the Holbein, but perhaps this latter falls within what can be identified more centrally as an anamorphosis of space. The usual regime of spatial relations is guaranteed by one crucial condition. The registers of inside and outside fit. This is both a logical and a topological point. Logically, inside and outside must be considered as mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive. The topological correlate of this is that the inside and the outside coincide in an unproblematic form. They are completely isomorphic. Now, this isomorphism applies not only to the spatial categories of inside and outside, but also to all those infamous pairs of occidental thinking habits. Mind, body, essence, appearance, subject, object, male, female. I shall want to add the pair phallic castrated. To subject any of these pairs to an anamorphotic process is to reveal the extent to which each term of the pair is not in contradiction to the other term, and the extent to which the relations between them, far from conforming to clean cut isomorphism, are strewn with strange thresholds and hybrid forms. I should argue that something of this work of anamorphosis is carried out by Orlan. Now, I'll simply show you the first slide to show you what she looks like. Uh, that's actually left right wrong, but um, I hope all the others aren't. Uh, that's her marked up uh, for a particular operation, the latest one that I'm going to talk about. 
Okay. Could I have the right back on, please? The next one isn't for quite a long time. It is difficult to identify the moment of the work in Orlan's art. There is her body and the records of its transformation through surgery. Her body and the spectacle of its consumption create a kind of corpus. Her operations are networked live by satellite and reach a worldwide audience. The operations, in addition to being televised, are directed by Aura in the aptly named Operating Theatre. She directs under local anaesthetic to stage a general pain. To give you an idea of this, I will describe a videotape, Omnipresence, uh, the operation was done in 1993, of a facial operation which involved cutting away sections of skin and installation of implants, not to mention the multiple and grueling injections. It is carefully staged, though it is sometimes artistically propositional. Near the beginning, we see lime green masks and red sheets. The supporting cast looks strange. A young man in a black mask looks like a wizard that has something to do with television. A translator to translate into English, and a man who sports a tall lime green hat is there to sign for the death. But the audience is to be wider than this. Not only is the operation to locally relate to New York Gallery, but to Toronto, Paris, Tokyo, and beyond. Rare clocks show the times in different zones. Messages and faxes pour in from as far afield as Latvia. Or on the plastic. The operation is under, under local anesthetic. The suspense mounts is Dr. Kramer, who is indeed a, a woman English surgeon but who practices in New York. Marks all our space with dots to indicate the line of surgical cuts at the sites of implants. Injections follow, and the worldwide audience winces. Ola is asked about this from some end of the world and confesses to some pain. She sits up, her Isimaraki dress drawn up just below her knees. She is serene as she lies down. No injections. She is taped up. Uh, a part of her arm connected to the face. Before the first incision, she talks on and on her future plans, Greco Roman iconography. Her ear has cotton wool stuffed into it. On and on she talks about champagne. More injections in the ear, in the head. A fax from Barbara Rose. A fax from Paris says, Let's give Orlan a hand. And indeed, has a drawing of hand, you see. I think you'll see it on the first clip. As the knife cuts, she goes on talking about friends. The surgeon cuts for 10 minutes, producing a number of flaps in front of the ear, behind the ear, behind the temple. The ear begins to come away from the face. The body of suffering is produced in the spectator, if not in the patient. All our demands that the yellow sheets under her be lifted and displayed. We see a bloody patch which drips. Flaps are enlarged. At last, an implant is inserted over the left brow. I am very pretty, she quips. There is still more. An injection in the neck and a small tube inserted into her face to separate the skin from the flesh. Kramer's finger follows, separating. Now her lipstick is removed so that her lips can be injected. Finally, it seems that Kramer can't go on and we are spared any more. I think she's been on the table for an hour by then. The dominant effect of the video, or at least this year, is horror. The effect of the needles piercing flesh, of the knife severing the face, of the blood leaking from incisions. A of the treatment of the face is the point where we see that the face is detachable. Finally, the horror of seeing this, and not knowing where all the seeing will end. How are we to understand the provocation of such anxiety in the spectator? Is she mad? Certainly this issue filled a special, uh, this question filled a special issue of a French journal of mental health. And I think that answer was she wasn't, but I haven't actually seen it. Cosmetic surgery aims at a refiguration of the face or figure. To this, Ola adds the constraint that the images to which refiguration is directed come from her choice of features from old master paintings. She is turning herself into an art historical morph. She is an image trapped in the body of a woman. When she speaks, 
of women to women transsexualism, which is what she did at the ICA early last year, that was exactly right. She was changing, not from one thing into another, metamorphosis, but from one register into another. What is at stake is abstraction through art, both the art of the image and the art of the scalpel. She claims to be flesh, become image. Refiguration touches on the psychotic. In the case of a man who is convinced he is a woman trapped in the body of a man, the transsexual act is the attempt to avoid psychosis. Yet it involves not the empirical wish to be a woman rather than a man, but the omnipotent denial of sexual difference as such. For frequently, the earth's refiguration involves the wish not to become a woman, but to become the woman, capitals. That is, to become the phallus through castration. Clearly, all of works differently. They both submit to the knife, but in Orlan's case, it is not to cross the frontier of sexual difference, but as a woman-to-woman -woman transition. That is, from her individuality to what she artfully chooses. Now, the fact that she uses representations of the same sex doesn't settle the issue of her relation to psychosis. She might still be aiming to be the woman, to become the phallus with all the help she could muster in the galleries of Western representations of women. Rather, the question of psychosis touches the issue of completeness. By becoming the woman capitals, the transsexual is convinced that he will be complete. Something of this wish informs all desire to be surgically altered. It can be thought of as turning the knife against castration. The question is, where does all our work fit in with this psychotic strain in the denial of sexual difference and the wish to be the phallus? My own thoughts about this concern not some pseudo diagnosis of Orlan, she must be mad, but a concern with the effects of her work upon the spectator. How are we to understand this cosmonesis, especially in respect to sexual difference? The famous debate between Freud and Jones concerned whether a woman is born or made. In some ways, the debate has been repeated so often that it has almost lost its meaning. They seem two different routes to the same destination, being a woman. For all of these terms seem irrelevant. Being a woman is dependent on continuously being born through surgery. Birth and making are conflated in art. Aura is only the new aura. She is a picture whose origin erases the difference between being born and being made. In our new presence, there is a moment which captures this in a literal way. The beginning of the operation starts with the removal of her makeup. It is taken off at the hands of another in a way which prefigures the moment when her face is partially detached from its customary base. She is then remade, reborn, as the image of an image. The first question is, is this the same as the conventional economy which governs cosmetic surgery, of having your face fixed? Or is this a cosmonesis which obeys a different structure? The economy of cosmetic surgery is always towards completeness. It is not just that one type of nose is preferable to another. It is that only the new nose will complete my image. Until I have surgery, I am unfinished. The usual experience of being unfinished is that I am too much myself and too little of the image which will complete me. No matter what strange imperatives drive all onto the surgeon's knife, I wish to argue that its effect on the spectator is quite different from the narcissistic optimism of cosmetic surgery. She may become an image, but the image in question is made empty by the operation. Her work shows the emptiness of the image, not the triumph of completeness that the dominion of the image seeks to induce. And of course, that will be my argument in the second half of the paper to explain what I mean by this emptiness of the image. In this sense, Orlov's work undoes the triumph of representation. During her operation, Orlov's face begins to detach itself from her head. We are shocked at the destruction of our normal narcissistic fantasy that the face represents something. Gradually, the face becomes pure exteriority. It no longer projects the illusion of death. 
which becomes a mask without any relation of representation. And you'll see that very clearly in the clips. In turn, this disturbs a fundamental illusion concerning the inside and the outside, that the outside provides a window onto what is represented. In this sense, Orla uses her head, quite literally, to demonstrate an axiom of at least one strand of feminist thought. There is nothing behind the mask. Indeed, feminist criticism has for some time been seized by the problematic of the operating theater of that section of female corpses. And if Michelson discussed the 1792 I'm going to say Watson of Sassini and Perini and reproduced it in its three different states, uh, in her 1984 article in October. It's an anatomical model which has a lid. But I say two different states. One is with the lid on, you take off the lid, you see the inside. And then there's yet a third uncovering that I couldn't quite get the gist of. And it was in the uh, magazine October 1984. Her description of the Waxen Venus as the culmination of the tradition of anatomical models is perfectly described. And I quote, her balance uh, so, by the way, if you've seen Gustavo Zizek's new book, Metastasis of Enjoyment, that is the waxen Venus in its middle state, with the lid off and exposing the organs. Her balance, her posture, her ever so slightly parted lips, her long, gleaming tresses, I wish I had a slide, her pearl necklace, the tasseled silken coverlet upon which she lies, these in the presence of pubic hair, none of these indispensable for the purpose of anatomical demonstration, fashion an object of fascinating desire in which the anatomist's analytic is modulated by the lambent sensuality of Bernini. This Venus yields, responds, one feels, to the anatomist's ruthless penetration with the ecstatic passivity of Saint Teresa. The same Venus pops up here on the cover of Slavoj Zizek's Metastases of Enjoyment. Now it is without its lid. It is a gate with its organs exposed. This figure permits, indeed invites, our sexual predatoriness as a response to its passivity. Not only can she be devoured by the eyes, the meal she presents exists layer by layer, course by course. This gustatory penetration of the eye also dictates Ludmilla Giordanova's description, which is quoted in Juliana Bruno's Street Walking on a Ruined Map. The Rambert describes the unveiling of the female corpse in a painting. A particularly vivid example is a German painting and lithograph of a beautiful woman who had drowned herself, being dissected by an anatomist, Professor Lukai. A group of men, comprising both artists and anatomists, stand around the table on which the corpse is lying. She has long hair and well-defined breasts. One of the men has begun the dissection and is working on the belly and chest. He is holding up a sheet of skin close to her breast, as if it were a thin article of clothing so delicate and fine in its texture. The picture leads us to the idea that dissection is itself a process of unveiling. That's the end of the quote. But this whole description of the predatory eye and the layers of the corpse leaves the normal distinction between inside and outside undisturbed. The unveiling version of clinical anatomy, in which the woman is a passive structure of layers, permits a mapping of the woman's body, which in respect to any one layer, maintains the distinction between inside and outside. It would persist right down to the microscopic sections of the woman's tissues. By contrast, Emma is not unveiled or stripped bare. There is no signifying interior to be discovered. Rather, the detachment of her face, a maneuver which reveals it as pure exteriority, is one which casts a doubt on representation, which insists on its emptiness. Psychoanalysis is often used the distinction between the inside and the outside as an index of and a means for describing mental states. Indeed, its entire vocabulary of internalization and externalization positively requires not just the description of these conditions, but a theoretical justification of the terms. Unfortunately, most psychotic theories are able to make a problem of these terms, much to the detriment of current conceptions of internal space. For example, in Donald Meltzer's work on the autistic child, he claims that the autistic child's problem stems from the lack of a clear boundary between the inside and the outside. 
As an example of the lack of distinction, he turns to Tintin Abbey as an architectural ruin which forms a correlate of the lack of distinction. He claims that in its ruin, the boundaries between the inside and the outside have become confused. The lack of a roof invites the sky in. Through the damaged walls and glassless windows, the landscape enters. The glass floor of the ruin belongs to the outside. From without, one can see through the building in the many places which would normally convince the eye of its solidity. Mason then tries to put, uh, sorry, tries to put this into the context of the relation between the geography of fantasy and the geographic type of confusion experienced by the autistic child. He chooses the image of Tintin Abbey as an analogy for the child's mother, a paper-thin mother without a delineated inside. But Tintin Abbey, Abbey ruined does not work like this. Many buildings in this century, glass houses for instance, invite the sky in. I'm indebted to our cousins at this point. <laughs> so this is the landscape to enter. Deliberately juxtapose the ground and the roof without thereby confusing the inside and the outside. The inside depends on a regime of representation and experience in which it is inferred from the outside as well as isomorphic with the, inside, with the outside. If anything, the rule of Tintin Abbey strengthens and makes strange the distinction between inside and outside. It is stripped of the clues which clutter the normal regime without destroying it. It strengthens the distinction by making it minimal. Indeed, Metz's own evidence proves the point when he puts his interpretation to bear on a child's drawing. On one side, he says, this autistic child's drawing, and the child drew on both sides of a sheet of paper, on one side is an ornate house seen from the front, a house in Northwood. And on the other side, a back view of a pub in South End. And he says, when you enter by the front door, you simultaneously exit by the rear door of a different object. It is, in effect, an object without an inside. No, it is not. It is a door with two different outsides which do not match any space. It is two incompatible spaces welded onto a door. Tintin Abbey is not a crazy door. What is lacking is space, not an inside but there is no outside of the door. Or rather, the inside is inside the door, and as such, is inaccessible. The inside is pure impermeability. There is simply the sequence of objects which lie beyond the door. The child is locked in relation to a door which can only open, but cannot disclose. We are not so concerned with such disturbance. But in an unhinging the very relation between inside and outside, which Meltzer demands as the conditional normality. The interest of psychoanalysis is precisely in its demonstration that psychically the condition is never met. It insists that far from being complementary opposites, inside and outside rely on a certain coincidence rather than on opposition. We can trace this both in Freud's idea of unheimlich, the uncanny, and Lacan's concept of extinct Madame Vola, in his article on Frankenstein's monster, which is called I Shall Be With You On Your Wedding Night, Lacan and the Uncanny, claims that Lacan had to make up the term extinct because French had no term equivalent to unheimlich. You will know that Freud, in his paper on the uncanny, starts by considering Thus, Unheimlich to be the opposite of Heimlich, but finds he is wrong with the aid of a dictionary. At one point, the opposites are identical. The word Heimlich can travel from comfort and familiarity of the homely and the known all the way to the hidden and the dangerous. It is there that Lacan locates the point of extinct This is how Madame de la put it. It points neither to the interior nor to the exterior but is located there where the most intimate interiority coincides with the exterior and becomes threatening, provoking horror and anxiety. The extimate is simultaneously the intimate kernel and the foreign body. In a word, it is unheimlich. What could I uh, say we need to uh, make more complex the notion? Um, what could be further from a simple opposition between the inside and the outside? 
Not only are the terms radically implied in each other, but they resist all notions of a fit, so beloved, of psychological and sociological reasoning. Within such reasoning, the subject, a space of interiority, establishes a relation with the world, a space of exteriority, which consists in just the right amount of internalization and externalization for normality to exist and persist. Linked but separated, the interior and exterior worlds fit because of a preordained isomorphism. The internal and external spaces are always already made for each other. And I think that's psychological and sociological thought, and I'm concerned with psychoanalytic thought. All right, the next 10 minutes are the trickiest ones and the most interesting ones theoretically, and after that I go back to Orla and try and make it work. <coughs> What I've done is I've taken the work of an American analyst, uh, Judith Kestenberg, on female sexuality using quite centrally the notions of internalization and externalization. I describe the case of hers as she presents it, and then I try uh, and use the notion of the Lacanian object in which to re theorize that case. Once you've got the notion of the Lacanian object, I can make the rest of my argument very easily. So this is uh, a sort of crucial point. The psychoanalyst Judith Kestenberg uses notions inside and outside centrally in her case presentations of girls in the developmental account of the transition from pregenital stages to the phallic stage and from latency to adolescence. This account is governed by the norm of the sexuality of the adult woman. I quote, the vagina as a middle organ with qualities of expansion and shrinking and the readiness to be desexualized when it serves expulsion and to be sexualized when it serves the reception, is uniquely and sensitively calibrated to shift from externalization to internalization and vice versa. We can follow Kestenberg's analytic constructions in the case of Magda, whom she saw from nine to her early teens. At nine, Magda experiences an overwhelming excitement, but is thought to have no psychical means to organize her sexuality. Later, she is able to distinguish an outside and inside, and experiences the excitement as belonging to the inside. The inside takes the form for Magda of a box in which someone she calls Sit, S I T that less, hides, right? A box in which Sit. Sit is a cripple who tortures Magda with his control of her inside. Kestenberg interprets sit as Magda's illusory penis, which controls her inside. Outside, Magda has control, but her titular masturbation, which she calls skin and bones, has no connection with sit. Why is that the particular phase? There's this kind of separation the inside and the outside. Kestenberg shows how, with analysis, Magda tries to externalize the excitement. Progress. Plain delivery. She cannot penetrate far into her uterus and exclaims. He wants to stay there. He does not want the box in which he hides to be broken. Instead of getting into the box, quote, when you put the tip of your finger there, there is nothing. There's nothing. It seems that there are two problems. Sit doesn't want to come out, and there's nothing in there to come out. The analyst tries to repair this topography. The first move is to lend a sense of structure to the nothing inside. It turns out that Magda does have some sense of the walls of the uterus and their capacity for suction and distension. She also experiences these actions having effects which are strongly localized and having effects on other bits of her anatomy. So she becomes very excited about playing with puppets during her session because they have that kind of remote control with the puppets. For the experience is what I want, quote, to experience the vagina as an active outer organ she could touch and feel. And this is how the analyst theoretician is construing it. This can be thought of as a transitional moment in the construction of an active inner organ. It now needs to be internalized on this model. What needs to happen now is to work on what might be called the fit. Quote, so clothes for the doll, she worked through her worries about the size of the vagina, about its expansion and contraction. The question of scale is important, not in terms of cognition, but in terms of the psychical representation of the topography of organs. By now, Magda has a new representation of the box. 
it is no longer nowhere. The matter she encountered is now a scaled object. By providing a set of a stable representation of it, she is calmer. The internal and external worlds have begun to fit around the experience of sexuality, which has a scaled topography in which things fit. Now, without criticizing this at a descriptive level, there are some notable theoretical conditions of this work. The analysis works as a kind of topographical education. Magda is seen to have a deficit of experience. She does not experience the inside and the outside as she must if she is to accede to a successful femininity. Her account of space needs to be repaired. What is absent from this account is any symbolization of lack of the idea of castration. Now, it is certainly true that the concept of castration has fallen upon hard times. It has given offense to so many that even within standard analytic work, it has moved to the sidelines of the theoretical and clinical writing. But for Lacan, as for Freud, it is a central concept. It informs not just an element of the account of sexuality, it defines the very nature of the subject and the object. It is not an optional extra for metapsychology. It is the insistence on lack that constitutes the human order in these accounts. This world requires a different topology of the subject. And only when I set that up can I make my claim as to what all along is actually doing. Such an account might take its initial bearings from the Lacanian account of the object. This ra account radically undermines the simple opposition of such an object, an opposition between the space of human interiority and social objectivity. The subject is always already bound in Lacan's account to being the subject of the signifying chain. The object, by contrast, is not something that is meant or referred to within the order of signification. The object is a point of resistance for the subject, something which Lacan calls the leftover of the real. In this sense, the object is not part of the signifying chain, it is a whole in that chain. It is a whole in the field of representation. But it does not simply ruin representation. It mends it as it ruins it. It both produces a whole, this point of resistance, and it is what comes to the place of lack to cover it over. This is an object quite part of the common sense definition of an object. It is not a thing in space. It is not an object which language refers to. Nor is it what psychoanalysis calls the object of desire, that wishes for this or that to do which and what with. Lacan's teasing formulation, which so irritates our sense of causality, is that the object is the cause of desire. Desire is not directed toward the object. It does not come at the object from behind. Desire is in front of the object. So what we're saying is that lack causes that movement along the signifying chain, which is desire, in order to fill the gap, but it will never happen. The object we're speaking of is not the object of philosophical inquiry, but an object of anxiety. As such, it occupies a different topological location from an object of desire. The exemplar in psychoanalytic theory is separation from the breast. It is a model for what happens to the interior of the infant when it experiences a separation from an external object, mother. But what finds this empirical separation as the model of separation? Outside the humanist conception of the separation of lovers, where or when is the separation? What is its action? In his seminar on anxiety, Lacan claims that it occurs somewhere between the breast and the maternal body. Right? Somewhere between the breast and the maternal body. The breast is still part of the infant and is also part of the mother. Now, clearly, this is not exclusive to Lacan. It could be part of the object relations description of the mother infant diet. But what Lacan is determined to think through is the ruination of the inside outside distinction which this situation implies. Inside and outside are not exclusive terms. The object, which we philosophically call a breast, is to be conceived both as something from which the infant is to be separated externally, at the same time as it is internally separated from it. Taking something from the adult orally will always awaken the same economy. The double register internal-external corresponds not to an isomorphic anxiety I fear I may be deprived, but to the fact that the best is both an object of desire and a point of anxiety in the other. 
the anxiety the mother lacks. Somewhere between the mother and the infant, lack emerges. Lack is not a disease carried by mothers or infants. It is a function of separation. This thing, the breast, is not just a crucial organ between the mother and child. It is a fragrant topos, a thing around which one teaches various lessons. As such, it places place around other Freudian objects whose inventory Lacan extends. These objects are not things. They are in part causes, stories, and also parts of the body. Freud installs the breast, feces, and phallus. Lacan adds the voice, the gaze, and the nothing, which is less well known. So we're talking about an object nothing, which is quite unlike Kessenberg's or Magda's nothing. Now the objects, voice and gaze, operate at the level of castration and Oedipus complex, and they are crucial to understanding Rorau's art. But first we must address the prior level of nothing as it manifests itself in Magda's case. This is crucial to the interpretation of the problem in Magda of lack and its relation to castration and sexual difference. Magda's nothing does not have a topography. The so-called externalization turns her lack into a fetish. In this case, the girl's response to the Oedipus complex may, contrary to conventional accounts, be taken as a moment when the object nothing is nothing but a substitute. The object always borders on lack, being compelled only to represent itself in one way or another. Viewed from one angle, the object, including the object nothing, is always a fetish. And this object, by definition, comes to cover over the lack. But the name of what covers over nothing, and this is the most important point, can itself start to be called lack. Lack is not a deficit, but a structure of a wish to complete, which includes the denial of incompleteness. It is an economic, in the Freudian sense, rather than a phenomenological reality. This structure of the concept of lack means, by definition, that the lack is neither manifestly inside or outside. The idea of lack is thus free from the idea of a deficit, or that it is a property of an object or a place. It is a property of the structure as such. Okay, that, that was the heaviest bit. <laughs> Goran, could you be to my mic, because I've got to take my jacket off. We're talking about objects in a way in which the object covers a place such that when the object is in place, all these oppositions that we talked about are also in place. Right? There's like a, a, a knot that gives us what we normally and philosophically conceive as, as uh, our everyday reality. And when this object shifts and covers the nothing underneath, and covers the lack, then these oppositions also quake, if not collapse. And what my argument about all I will be is, and it's, and it's difficult to make, how you talk about uh, images, bits of video, or whatever, in such a way as to make this analogy work. I.e., what is happening in Oron's case, at certain moments in the video, is the shifting of the object from its place. And if I can make that argument, then I'm hoping I can then say, so inside, outside, also collapse, just as phallic castrated male, female, and all the other oppositions collapse. Everything is held in place when lack is in place, and lack is in place when the object covers lack. And I'm trying to say that, that is the Lacanian understanding of space that helps me to make my analysis of all along. So it is a question of the emptying out of the place of the object. It's a 
expression of the moment in which the subject can apprehend the character of the structure that there is a boy at its heart. And it's only at that moment that analytically speaking, there is some leeway to change. So I'm also relying very, very implicitly on an analogy with the clinical situation. Because I think that the object shifting from its place is also what happens at the end of the clinical analysis. Okay, now I shall leave the nothing, which is really very difficult to think about. Uh, I couldn't resist it, since Maggie used the word nothing. And we will talk about the gaze. The voice is also very, very important in Oron's work. In fact, it strikes most people who look through the whole video that she goes on and on and on and on and on. And the voice has a very special role. Indeed, the object voice, we can call it, has a very, very special role. But I'm not analyzing that today. I'm merely talking about the object gaze. When the voice supports the place of the other, the girl's castration is covered over. But there can develop a moment when there is an emptying out of the place of the object. The object which covers over the point of anxiety in the other shifts from its place and a space of lack opens up. As long as the voice supports the place of the other, everything in the world is seamless and logical. The distinction between phallic and castrated is in place. The distinction between inside and outside is fixed. But at a certain moment, the anamorphotic moment, the gaze detaches from the other. Suddenly, all these distinctions and their framework collapses. So what happens in the whole line is that the hole opens up, right? Death of the skull opens a hole in the picture of plenitude. We will see in all our omnipresence that the phallic and the castrated become simultaneous, not mutually exclusive terms. Such a simultaneity has an important consequence in understanding sexual difference. For to consider the object is by definition to consider difference. Any kind of difference, any kind of opposition, including sexual difference. Orwell's work provides a means of thinking this. But how can Orwell's woman-to-woman transsexualism in her operation bear upon sexual difference? After all, at least in a man-to-woman transsexualism, the question of sexual difference is surely put, even if the answer is unexpected, in that the phallus is what the transsexual wishes to be, and losing the penis is the root to that. Certainly, castration is relevant to both. Both use the knife to refigure the body. Both seek signification at the price of the body. Indeed, castration is always in the service of meaning. But such transsexualism is nevertheless a way of denying castration and therefore sexual difference. The woman, capitals, is the uncastrated one, the phallus. And without castration, there is no sexual difference. But of course, in this scheme, the phallic and the castrated continue to be poles apart in the scheme for the transsexual. Not so with Orlon. Her woman's woman transsexualism does not obey the same logic. It shows that the image is a mask and that there is nothing behind it. The power of her work is here, in the surgical manipulation of her face, rather than the conscious program of art historical references, which really are no more than rationalization. It is here in the operating table that castration occurs, not in the act of cutting, not in the drama of the knife, not in the barely suppressed frenzy of it all, but in the space which is opened up, in the space in which the face is unmade. It is the space between the bloodied place which we see all around her ear and the face as it lifts from its customary base. Something flies off. This something is the security of the relation between the inside and the outside. It ceases to exist. There is suddenly no inside and no outside. There is an emptying out of the object. It is a moment, a horrified moment, of the birth of a new space which ruins habitual space. All our urge to create might be summarized, let there be space. Of course, this is not all our account. Her subjective account is that with each operation, she becomes more distant from her body. It is as though she slaps off her body to enter the pure subjectivity of speech. It is as though the body is surgically severed from speech. You might think she undergoes pain and anguish, but the operation hurts her only a little. True, the injections hurt, but aspirin suffices. While lying on the surgical table, what she experiences is the overwhelming desire to communicate. 
faxes flood in from Russia, Latvia, Canada, and France. She speaks to the intellectuals of the Pompidou Center. She sets off on the highway of information. But the spectator is forced to tarry in this circus, and a circus it is with all these uh, bit players that I described earlier, in this staging of speech to witness something, in the staging of speech to witness something else, the something else which insists. Okay, now this slide, I mean, if you're really squeamish, please don't look at this slide. Can I have the next slide? Oh, sorry, they're all left to right wrong. I mean, can you see what I mean? It's a big other way. I mean, that's her left ear. <laughs> okay, I think that's enough of that. Could I have the light on again, please? The spectator does not gain, the spectator does not gain a divorce from Orlan's body. The effects of what the spectator sees of the exposed cuts and cavities can be best described by recalling Lacan's gloss on a moment in the founding dream of ana psychoanalysis, Freud's dream of Irma's injection. It is the moment when he looks down her throat, and this is what Lacan says about it. There's a horrendous discovery here, that of the flesh one never sees, the foundation of things, the other side of the head, of the face, the, secre the secretory glands par excellence, the flesh from which everything exudes, at the very heart of the mystery, the flesh inasmuch as it is suffering, is formless, inasmuch as its form is itself something which provokes anxiety. Spectre of anxiety, identification of anxiety, the final revelation of you are this, you are this which is so far from you, this which is the ultimate formlessness. Freud comes upon a revelation of the type. That's uh, Lacan in Seminar 1. So Ola as Irma, horrifying us this time by way of the outer ear. So while Ola experiences little pain, she makes sure that we experience a more substantial pain. It is the pain of jouissance. For Orlan's operation has for us the effect of splitting the body from the signifier as a ceaseless reenactment of castration from the vantage point of where it has already happened. We are confronted with the horrifying spectacle of the rawness of the passion of the jouissance of the body as such, the jubilation of meat. She produces a confrontation with the real and a fear, not reality, the Lacanian real, and a fear that we will be swallowed into the full space of plenitude in which there is no room for us. Many spectators will turn away and close their eyes. Others will denounce the scene as cruel and horrific. If this were all, what you saw and the bits around it, they would be right. But these defenses cannot obscure the fact that something else has also happened. This something else is the emptying out of the face of the object as the object gaze detaches from the other. A gap is opened up in Orlan, in Orlan, a gap which is localized between her curled ear, isolated between expanses of raw and bleeding flesh, and her face. This, of course, is the opposite of the transsexual's triumphant accession to the phallus. While the phallus sustains representation, the emptying out of the face of the object means that the structural representation has collapsed. Consider how Orlan produces these effects. On the one hand, with her choice of images of old masters, the rhetoric of beauty and the woman, there is a standard phallic representation of the woman's portrait. Yet at the same time, there is an eruption from another side which ruins the scene. She works across such a gulf between the phallic woman and the suspension of the very space in which the phallus can appear. We find ourselves unhinged in a space that refuses to organize an inside and an outside. It is exactly the register of the object, of the leftover of the real, that Orla exploits so effectively. She is not simply refiguring herself in the mold of the Mona Lisa's forehead or the lips of Moreau's Europa, which she never got to because they stopped the operation and you couldn't get the lips, she was really bruising very badly by then. She is disfiguring the image. The image comes apart from itself in the surgery. Could we have the next slide, please? Next two slides, in fact.
that's the right way. Okay. And can you go back to the last one? All right, those two are what I call, I'm di differentiating these two as the mask and the moment of detachment as uh, contrasted with uh, all the blood and the gaps and flaps we see around the ear. You can see this more clearly in the clips, those of you who will watch the clips. All right, may I have the light on, please? Nothing fits any longer. Her operation destroys the distinction between the inside and the outside. The inside no longer lies patiently within the outside, contained and stable, and a guarantee that the world is just the world. This is one reason why spectators get so upset. She is not the nested Russian dolls that lie within each other, nor is she like the anatomical models with their organs beautifully resting under their lids, awaiting your prying eyes, nor is she like Tintin Abbey. How is this? Consider the specific moment in omnipresence when the left part of the face begins to come away. From what? Obviously, the unseen stuff behind it, which we can assume to be just as raw as the exposed flesh that frames the ear above and below. Someone who saw the scene with me remarked defensively that she was not frightened because she knew that the camera wouldn't dwell on the raw stuff. A, stra a strange remark, because it does dwell on such stuff. But it doesn't dwell on such stuff behind the face. It does it all in the area of the ear. There is a boundary which marks off the face from the frame in which it is habitually located. So there is raw stuff on the one side, but what is on the other side? A mask. What the viewer senses and the camera knows is the difference between the space of the real and the space vacated by the object. The space of the real is the full horrifying space of, of presence. The space vacated by the object is a more liberating space. The emptying of the place of the object produces that lack that was described earlier as not manifestly belonging to either the inside or the outside. What is shown <coughs> is a face as an appearance without essence, an appearance which borrows from famous models. We can't ask what is behind it. At this moment, Orwell's point about the mask takes effect. An unfillable gap opens at the moment that the face is lifted. This emptying out of the face of the object collapses the distinction between inside and outside, a distinction which is a regime. A mask, in the very associations which it calls up, suggests a face behind the mask. It does not imply what is relevant here, a gap. Her transsexualism with its implants is not concerned to move from one sex to another sex but to transform the confident existence of one sex, the imaginary completion of the body image towards the gap in representation which disfigures sexual difference. It doesn't deny it. Rather, it shows the co-presence of the phallic and the castrated that the real world, that is, the world of the imaginary, insists are exclusive of each other. This belongs not to psychosis, but to an artistic labor. Watching the video up to the moment of lifting the mask, so this is like a summary now and I will end in two minutes, the spectator is driven by the suspense of horror. I expect to see something more unspeakable than I have already seen. I am anxious. If Orlan doesn't feel pain, I certainly do. I am invaded by the experience of the body, heavy with its density. But then I am relieved and my watching is free from anxiety. I did not see what I dreaded. I saw a face become a mask. A gap opened. The lifting of all our face made this gap little. We are acutely aware of the mask, mask-like character of the face, and we apprehend it as an object which will be replaced, refigured. The successive character of the face underlines that there is nothing beneath the mask. Like Cindy Sherman's early work, the series of images is in principle without end. This has the effect of opening onto, or rather circling, a void. So for all now, there is no original and no end. This is far from those advertisements for cosmetic surgery which employ the structure of before and after to effect a closure of refiguration. The face which is not original and is not even seeking an end is one that many find difficult to tolerate. The effects of Ola's work 
are not confined to the images on the video alone. This is an additional small point. Consider her own physical presence in her conference presentation in front of the very video image of herself on the screen. She talks in front of, I mean, she's talking, of course, in front of the video. The contrast between this Orlan, theatrical and artificial in her long gown, usually another Ikimak, the gown, in possession of herself, and the other Orlan cut, bleeding, and supine on the operating table is stark. This situation of Orlan before Orlan completes the point I have been trying to make. Here, the succession of the moments of anamorphosis are presented simultaneously. The gap between the two images empties out the object. It is not that surgery has transformed her, but that surgery has changed our experience of the image. Of course, this is only one instance of emptying the image. The space which has opened is radical and has always been there. It is savagely inconvenient. But it is the space which is new from the point of view of knowledge. And I'd just like two more slides, please. Um, after you see what I'm calling the mask, you have further cuts. And I think it's a very difficult image to deal with. The next one, please. I think it's a very, very difficult image to deal with. I have nothing to say about it. It comes much, much further on. Than the, than the section I have analyzed. And could we have the last one? That is when the first implant went in and she said, I am very pretty, <laughs> and look, looked upwards. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now there are, I think the clips are exactly six minutes long. Um, those of you who really don't want to watch them, Please wait outside, and I assume we'll have a discussion at the end of six minutes. We're just going to run straight through the clips. It won't take longer than that.
Are people looking outside the door? <laughs> Anybody want to say anything? <laughs> <laughs> we don't ask questions. Do you want to make some comments on, on what you've seen? She can see this. This that question actually came up when I gave it to Slay last week, and uh, I think it was Tamar Garb who tried to pin her down because she was there in the, in the discussion. Because she does, she says that that she when she sees it on television, it's pretty afterwards, right? It's like pretty frightening. But then she's she's a spectator. At the same time, Tamar really caught her out by by saying, "But don't you watch the television screens in?" the operating theatre, and she said, of course I do, of course I do, with great indignation, but then claimed that at that point, um, she, you know, she didn't identify with the images of her, that she was sort of li living it, and that's a different space. I mean, I don't disbelieve her, I don't think we would disbelieve her. What, what I like the way you screw it in. <laughs> well, as I said, I think one of the things she's doing all the time is talking. Because she wants to claim, she really wants to claim that it's, uh, I mean, this is my gloss, that it's a triumph of subjectivity over the body. You know, she wants to say, it's more distant from it, obviously, it's that and the other. And what she, what she doesn't actually therefore realize is um, she, she doesn't in a sense want to accept that the mechanisms by which the audience responds are, are somehow appropriate even, because she wants to cancel out the dimension of pain. And I think one of my points is that she is using pain in its most transformative moment. And I think that what I mean by that, I mean, I'll, I'll give the anecdote that I think suggest this very clearly, uh, and it's an H.E. Wells story that I couldn't finish reading. Uh, I read it in very, very early 60s as an undergraduate, and I couldn't finish it. I was so frightened. And it's called The Island of Dr. Moreau, and it's about vivisection. And it's very interesting because Michael Fried has recently written um, an article on it in a book that is devoted to Frankenstein, and with no apology, this particular chapter is about the Highland of Dr. Moreau. It is really quite bizarre. It's edited by Stephen Dan and somebody else. It, it just, just came out a month ago. And um, he does a fairly rationalist kind of account of it. And what's very, very interesting is, he, is that he then says, well, what's the pain here for? You know, Wells gives this or that uh, explanation and it doesn't work. And this is most unlike Wells, he says. Because normally he's, you know, very rational and everything fits and he can tell you why he's done something. So sort of pain is an excess kind of left over. Uh, at that point. And he says, well, after all, you know, it, it could have been that the animals, well, I'll tell you the story for those who don't know, that there are animals on this island, of course, it's written by somebody who shipwrecked, went to the island, met Dr. Moreau, who's a receptionist, and heard terrible screams in the middle of the night, but really terrible, enough to make me stop reading the book. And uh, what was happening was beasts were being turned into men by uh, operations on their larynxes. Operations without anesthetic. So Freed, I mean, incredibly rationalistically says, and you could have done it with, you know, with anesthetic, <laughs> and still doesn't cotton on to the function of the pain, you know, and the function of the pain is to blast you into horror. I mean, it is, and I think something very similar is happening uh, with the oil uh, And she doesn't know how to quite realize it. It, it may well be true and, uh, that she doesn't feel anything but a certain discomfort and aspirin suffices. The only exception she makes is for the injection. She says they hurt. Right? So 
otherwise. He says it as his composition, as it says this. Um, and that seems to me fine on her side, but on our side, I think she's very powerfully using, and I think knowing it as an artist, but not knowing it explicitly and consciously, what I'm calling this transformative condition. Uh, pain, stroke, horror, stroke, jouissance, stroke, the real, right? The real in all its kind of um, bloodiness. And so I was trying in this, when you first watch it, and the point is that if you watch, the videotape is an hour and 40 minutes, and it's, it's done pretty straight. And the first 40 minutes is all the setting up, so it's an hour of operation, which is quite a long time. Then it just pales away as, um, as they decide not to, not to proceed. And it's really very hard to watch. And it's, I, I mean, I, I cheat in a sense, because, you know, the point is, if you're going to watch to the end for whatever reason, I mean, how do you cope with all this watching? Because it's really hard. And I suppose what, what I've done is to say that actually, at the point at which I thought I couldn't bear it anymore, something lifted. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to theorize is the moment uh, where the object shifts from its place. So horrifying as it might seem to you, the, the moment that I'm calling the mark, the longest clip, is what I call the mark. Uh, actually, you watch them in a completely different way from when, when the surgeon is cutting and producing those deep hollows and flaps in the blood. Not just the blood, you know, it's these strange shapes around the ear. Um, but, so I'm calling that like the real, the horror, you know, the, the fullness and plenitude of, of the impossible. And then I'm calling the, the moment of the mask a kind of release from what she has produced as pure horror. And I don't think she herself um, makes any such distinction. And in fact, she rather petulantly said at, at the end of the discussion, she doesn't really understand English, uh, that um, it, the video was just technicalities. It was her mise en scène that, that, that mattered. Now, I don't actually think you can say that and tell a spectator who sits through the goddamn video. Of course, when she's in front of it in a conference hall, you know, it is part of the mise en scène. You don't really see it. She, she talks and she talks and she talks and she stands in front of it and, you know, she doesn't want you to see it in a sense. It really is. On the other hand, she sells them. They are part, you know, the work of art. So, um, I think it's just to, to, I mean, I don't think it will do to say, don't analyze the video. If you don't analyze, you're a very unlikely to be able to watch it, actually. <laughs> um, and, and all I can say again, and this again, you know, it's, it's not to cover my flank, but I think it is interesting, the same uh, student of mine, um, who actually herself teaches on a, on a fine art MA, uh, who said, don't worry, we, we won't, you know, we won't see the raw bit. Also said a week later that an hour after she'd left, she felt quite a sort of feeling of liberation. She couldn't explain it. And there is something about there is something about the tape. And and that's all I can say. You know, I was thinking it or you don't. Sorry, do you want to ask the question? But she, but she doesn't succeed, does she? Well, I mean, she thinks she can, I mean, she doesn't talk about the real, and she thinks she can go beyond, and she thinks she can have this moment of, this subjective moment, if you like, of speech, you know, her power. Uh, and I just don't think that any of it works like that. I mean, my entire analysis has been to suggest that even the horror she provo provokes in us certainly doesn't have that effect on us. So she may have a moment, you know, of pure, kind of elated subjectivity. What I'm trying to say is that I'm, I can't speak for what this activity does to her. I'm trying to analyze what it might do to a spectator. Yes, but then, then there wouldn't be any critical activity. why are you at this lecture? <laughs> in a sense, you know, what we say about images, yes, always partakes of that. But I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's quite the same as saying I feel more distant from my body and that I succeed in a sense, in, you know, in, in a belief in the, in the pure signifier. Whereas I'm precisely stressing the other side of it and saying that she is dealing uh, with the other side of it in her work. I mean, 
they should deal with the real, but no critic and no artist wants to talk about the real, okay. But that is actually what she's dealing with. Ever of this evening, mentioned all up. Okay, so, so, um, all right, uh, what, I, uh, what I'd like to say about that is that if we said it was exhibitionism, it would be, it would be uh, part of a perverse structure, as, right? And by that, and the perverse structure in, in, in the Kenyan terminology, since we're using that framework today, is precisely marked by the earth to completion. So my argument is going exactly the opposite way, and I think you're now agreeing that the, that the, the tape itself doesn't give you much ground for saying this is efficient. Oh, maybe there is an argument, but I haven't heard it, and I don't actually see it. Uh, that's really. So what the uh, exhibitionist does is make sure that the object covers the gap, make sure that the other has the object. And what is the object? The gaze, right? It's the exhibition that exhibits himself uh, and the person who's subjected to this produces the gaze, if you like. So the object is seen to be on, on the side of the other. And it's a moment of completion uh, in, in the Canadian civilization. But are you going to do that easily? <laughs> or are you going to say, I mean, try and make an argument about exhibitionism somehow? Shows, shows. Yes, but I'm making all the same moves that I did in my Peeping Tom paper. That's what Peeping Tom does, and I argued he was an exhibitionist even more than he was a voyeur, but I also argued there was moments in the film when the object left its place, exactly the same argument. With, with, you know, so that again, it's a chronological, I mean, it, it covers the whole film and it picks out a moment in the film when all the perversity that's absolutely there in Peeping Tom, you know, saturated with it, but where it's, dra it's drained out so that by the end of the film. Um, the way I think about it is you could send 12-year-olds on that argument to see the film because it's not a perverse film by the end. This is a make a good argument. So I think, so I think yes, you know, there is, a, there, there is a first moment and a second moment. So there's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I can't answer that question. All I can say is that it's one that needs investigation because people had said, um, there were some students at Sussex who said that they had seen a video on television of a real <laughs> cosmetic operation. And they said that it didn't affect them because they knew what it was. But I've also heard the opposite. Do you, you see what I mean? So it seems, it seems to me in each case, I don't actually want to generalize. I actually think that what you're looking at, you know, the, the structure and detail, and if you like chronology, of what you're looking at is incredibly important uh, in the, to the effect that's produced. And so you can't make, I mean, you can't say general things about scenes of rape or scenes of perversity or scenes of anything, because it depends entirely on how it's handled. And, and I think I really believe that quite, uh, quite seriously. But so, do you, have, do you want to say something about, I mean, do you have a conception of pain? No, that no.
that you mean, and that kind of highlights the pain in a sense. It's, it's what's on offer then, uh, specially. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably true. It's um, the thing about the, the, the surgeon hadn't occurred to me, but I do remember a student asking me years ago when I tried to describe uh, hysteria and hysterical paralysis and so on to a class um, in terms of um, how the, the body is dominated by the layman's knowledge of anatomy and not by actual anatomical knowledge. And somebody said, and uh, would the hysteria doctor, as it were, then not be subject to hysteria because he had the knowledge. <laughs> and it's an equally tricky question, I think, that you're asking about the, the surgeon. Um, because I don't, I think you've answered it's not the familiarity. I don't think it's the familiarity. I think it is the part of the stage. Thing. 